right? I want to ask quickly, are there any weirdos here? Okay. Yes, okay, there's quite a few of us. I'm glad to see that. So today I want to tell you that what we're going to be talking about is a weirdo. We're going to be talking about not just a weirdo, but also we're going to be speaking about a doubter, a doubtful kind of person. Do you ever have doubt? Yeah? All right, if you sometimes have doubt, then this sermon's for you. Maybe some of you are saying, I'm not a weirdo, I'm not a weirdo at all, and I'm not doubtful, I have absolute faith. I have one more question for you. Sometimes in your spiritual journey, or in life in general, do you ever feel confused? Yeah? Sometimes we go through, wow, sometimes we go through confusion, right? We don't know what to do. We don't know, maybe, I know we have some HSC students. They don't know what to study. Maybe in family situations, maybe at work, it might be in anywhere. Right? We go through these different things. We might feel weird. We might feel like we're an outcast. We might feel like, man, I just don't know. Reading the Bible, sometimes I'll be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe God says something to you and you're like, I want to believe it, but I just don't know if that's exactly the direction. I'm just going to use this one, sorry. Yeah. Maybe I think he wants me to go that way, but I just, oh, I'm not 100% sure. So as we go through, you know, maybe feeling like a weirdo or like an outcast or like we're so different from everyone else, as we go through, you know, these feelings of doubt, as we might go through confusion, it's really important for us to remember that we're not alone. All right? Have you ever felt one of those three things? Anyone? All right? Yeah, all of us at some stage, we've felt at least one of those three things. But here we see a story that I want to share with you. For those of you that have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Judges chapter 5. Now I'm going to take you back. A few weeks ago I talked about Judges, oh sorry, Judges chapter 4 and 5 is what we're reading today. Does anyone remember the person that we spoke about in Judges a couple of weeks ago? Anyone? Ehud. That's correct. It's a funny kind of name, Ehud. Now does anyone remember the cycle? The cycle of... Yeah, basically the cycle of the children of Israel. Does anyone remember? Did good, did bad, suffer. And then while they're suffering, were they like, oh yeah, we're just going to stay here, we're going to suffer and we're going to be happy. Is that what they decided? No, what did they do? They, yes, they prayed, they asked for forgiveness. They cried out to God to help them. And what did God say? Nah, you've been bad. I warned you. You knew you shouldn't have done that, so no. He turned his back. Is that what God did? No. He reaches out and he helps. And then again, for a little while, in gratitude and in recognition of who God is, they do good again. But then again, for those of you that have your Bibles, this is not working. So, oh, okay, it is now. I need to stand here. Evil, God removes protection. Israel cries for help. God returns and helps them. They repent. And then again... As we read in the Bible, Judges chapter 5, verse 1, for those of you that want to read along. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. Now, King Jabin, for any of you true like Bible scholars who study the Bible so, so much, you might be like, what's going on here? Because you know what? Joshua, generations ago, he killed King Jabin. So why is King Jabin back again? Jabin most likely was like a dynasty kind of name. So it was probably like his great-great-grandfather or whatever that Joshua destroyed. But they rose up again, and these people were again tormenting the children of Israel. So Jabin, the king of Canaan, he reigned in Hazel. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of what? Of iron. It's one thing to have chariots. All right, it's something else to have chariots of iron. It's a big deal. These were a big people. And he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. How many of you ever use the M4? Any of you that drive, do you ever use the M4 or the Great Western Highway? Yeah, I think we all kind of might use that at some stage. All right, I need you to know something here about Hazel. All right. It was a major city. It was a walled city. It was walled all around. It was actually the biggest city of its time in that area. All right? I'm going to tell you a few more things about it. 
All right, it was from the middle to late Bronze Age when it had its peak. It was 8.5 miles north of Galilee, and it was on a major trout route between Egypt and Mesopotamia. So let's say that this is, you know, that major trade route. And right here we have Hazor, right, like right around there. If you're an Israelite and you know that these people are oppressing you, what are you going to do when you need to go to the shops? People would not dare to walk on those roads because they knew that they would get robbed. They knew that they would get maybe have bad things happen to them. We're talking about women. Sometimes women can fall victim to crime even more than men. That's debatable. I know that men struggle as well. But this is the kind of things that were happening here in this city. All right, in the uptown part of Hazel, they had all the like maybe more political things. They had the palace, the admin buildings, the temples. And in the downtown, they had the residences and businesses. But it was a massive city. Here we see. Now, Deborah, what was Deborah? She was a prophet. She was a prophetess. She was the wife of Lapidoth. She was judging Israel at that time. Now, I want to stop before I read the next verse. For those of us who said that we feel like weirdos, how do you think it would feel to be a prophet? Hey, God sent me with a message to tell you this. Have, honestly, has anyone ever had someone come up to you and be like, I'm a prophet? Have you? Yeah? I have. What do you think of those people? Honestly, what do you think if someone tells you, I'm a prophet? Weirdos. weirdos. All right? Here we have one weirdo. She was a weirdo, one, because she was a prophet. But we keep reading, and also, not only was she a prophet, she was a judge. She was a judge in Israel. Already, that kind of makes her stand out more. She's different. How many of you like to be judged? You? You do? And with God as my judge, yes, but outside of that, I'm not keen to go into judgment. If you see someone who might judge, it's like, oh, you turn around the other way because we don't have those good connotations of judgment. We keep reading. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. I really liked Joshua's shirt. Joshua, you have a palm tree on your T-shirt today, on your top. This part between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, it's actually very strange. She's actually in a weird location. Not only is she a weirdo, but she's in a weird location because this area didn't have palm trees. But she would sit there under the palm of Deborah. So she's got one, one, she's a woman. All right? By the way, I was going to say that's what makes her even more weird. Because to have someone who's a prophet and a judge and sitting under a palm tree, it's kind of weird. But then on top of all that, she's a woman. We go on, and as we think of this weirdo, maybe we can empathize with her. Yeah? We go on. She comes to someone. She comes to the doubtful one. Does anyone know the name of the doubter? The doubting person she comes to in the story? Read with me in Judges chapter 5. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. What would you do if God told you to go? This massive city, the one that everyone knows, they're kind of bullies. No one even wants to go past their trade routes because if you do, even though it's the easiest way to get from A to B, you know you may get robbed or worse happen to you. But God's like, hey, get up. The people of Israel are crying out to me and I've chosen you, all right? I've chosen you to be the one to help them. What do you do? I'm not sure what that means. But, friends, here's the thing. As, sorry? Oh, sorry, judges. I don't know what I called it, sorry. But as we read through judges, 
Oh yeah, chapter 4. Sorry, it is Judges chapter 4. But later we're going to read from chapter 5. So here's the thing, when you look through Judges, uh, it's really interesting to note that Judges chapter 4 and Judges chapter 5, they tell exactly the same story, but in different ways. One is a poem. Judges chapter 5 is a poem. It's a battle song. Judges chapter 4 is just a story in prose. All right. So we keep reading. What would you do? God's called you to deliver his people. What do you say? What do you do? Barak basically said, nah. He wasn't sure. He doubted. He said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. There's a really interesting thing here. I don't know how many of you have read this before, but yesterday I noticed one new thing from it. When she says, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? The language actually indicates that he had already been told. I don't know if God had spoken to him directly. Maybe it was not the first time that Deborah had come to him and said, hey, get up, fight, go and save the people. But God had already told him. She's telling him, like, hasn't the Lord God of Israel commanded you? He's already told you. Why are you still here? But still, still he has doubt. And maybe that's like us because we know the Bible sometimes. We know different things about God. Maybe God's calling us to do this. Maybe he's telling you to stop doing this or to start doing this or to keep going when you want to give up. But we're like doubtful. That's what happened to Barak in this story. We read on. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Again, still it's Judges chapter 4, by the way. Here in Judges chapter 4, we have this story of this hero. Who's going to come and save the people of Israel? It has to be this big, strong Mighty warrior, Barak, he's the one chosen by God. It has to be him. But he's like, no, I won't go. And I'll only go if you come with me. After he's been told repeatedly, he's like, all right, fine, I'll go. But you have to come with me. I'm doubtful, I don't know. I'll go if you come. So along comes Deborah and she says, yes, I'll go. But who is the glory going to go to? A woman. And in the story, if you think, okay, the glory is going to go to a woman, this woman, Deborah, said she's going to go to battle. Who would you think that woman is, the one that's going to get the glory? You think, all right, Deborah. Maybe Deborah's the one who's going to bring victory. Deborah's the one who's going to destroy Sisera. We'll read on. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak called out Zebulon and Naphtali and Kadesh. 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Then there's this kind of weird bit that's in here, and we're like, why is this here? Verse 11. Now Heba the Kenite had separated from the Kenites the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. So Hobab is another name for Jethro, Raul. He's called different things. So this is important. This is going to come into play later, but it seems really random. It's like, this is happening here. They're going to war. They're about to attack. Oh, and by the way, there's these people over here and, you know, that they're related to Moses, Moses' father-in-law, Hobab. It's completely unrelated. It's like, why? Do you ever read the Bible and you're like, why? Do I need to know this? You do need to know this, and we'll come back to it in a second. So, he had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zana Nim, which is near Kadesh. By the way, Kadesh is where they're going to fight. What we see here is this weirdo. All right, this weird prophet, woman, judge, sitting under a random palm tree in the middle of somewhere where a palm tree shouldn't be. This weirdo becomes a warrior. She comes, and she's not just any kind of warrior. She goes out and she fights. She wasn't just there as an ornament. She was there to fight, and she was there to strategize. It's really interesting. Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given you Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera, by the way, what was Sisera known for? They had 900 
iron chariots, not just any chariots, these are iron chariots. They're known for walking, like fighting and like, you know, we talked about Ehud, he grabbed his sword and he was fighting and, you know, would have had to like duck and try to hide and stuff. It's like, that's for losers. I just sit in my chariot and I just take off and I just throw spears and like spears and javelins. That's what I do. That's the kind of leader, that's the kind of boss that I am. This man, Sisera, who's known for not having to walk around and like be agile like other swordsmen. No, he's, he's in his chariot. He just throws a javelin and you die, basically. He can run you over with his chariot. What is this mighty man? What does he now come to? It's really interesting. The Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots until Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on a foot. This is mentioned more than once. It's like the writer saying, ha, doesn't matter how strong you think you are. If you don't have God, if you're hurting God's people, God's not going to put up with it. He will humble you. We read on. It's not so much in the Judges chapter 4 story, but when you read Judges chapter 5, it adds some information. Now, they were there. All right, we see the Kishon River. They were fighting in Kadesh. Does this have a pointer? All right, yeah. So they were here. They were fighting in Kadesh near the Kishon River. And in Judges chapter 5, actually chapter 5 this time, it actually adds some story. It adds some information. It tells us. It should be Judges chapter 5. From heaven, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with the galloping, the galloping of his steeds. God sent a rain, a torrent, a mighty, mighty torrent. Right? It was raining and raining. And this wadi, I don't know how to, if you say that, you know, it's kind of like a desert area. When it rains, it just becomes completely muddy and miry. And can a chariot work in those kind of circumstances? No. This is what God did. This was his part. The people came against these mighty people. And the reason why the chariots didn't work is because God sent the storm. God sent the waters so that their wheels got stuck. They probably had to like undo their horses. That's why the horses galloped off because like, if not, they would have just sunk down with the iron, heavy iron chariots. God helped in this battle. The doubtful suddenly became determined because while Sisera gets out and he's running away, the one that was like, I don't know if I want to go. I'll only go if you come with me. What does he now do? Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Who was left? No one. Friends, do we want to oppose God? Do we want to bully his people? We don't. Are we glad that we are God's children? God cares for us and what we're going through. The same way he cared for Israel, he cares for us. And at the right time, even when we're going through hard times, through storms and torrents and whatever, God can save us. He might even use those torrents, those storms, to save us and we don't even realize. What about the confusion? All right, I talked about the weirdo. God turned her into a warrior. Then there was the doubter, the doubtful, but God turned the doubtful into the determined, right? We saw Barak have that change. Now another woman, she was confused. Her name was Jael. Can I see your hand if you've heard of Jael before? All right, there's quite a few of you. She's like one of my favorite people in the Bible. I think she's amazing. I don't know if you knew that she had this conflict. And you know verse 11 when it's like, oh, the battle's going on and there's this big city and there's these bullies that are trying to destroy God's people. Oh, and these Hobab, Jethro's, you know, Moses, father-in-law's family over here. The reason why I mentioned that is because that was Jael's family. She had a choice to make. Because see, she knew about the war. It was pretty close to her. She knew what was going on. She knew about Hazel. She knew about King Jabin. She knew about Sisera. She had this confusion. As we read the story, she had a big decision to make. Judges chapter 4, 17. 
But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite. And there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heba the Kenite. That's her house. So she's there. There's peace. I, like, I, I don't have any beef with Jabin. I don't have any, anything between us. We're friends. We have a truce. We're allies in theory. Verse 18. Jael came out to meet Sisera. So did he find her or did she find him? She's the one who came out. She came out to meet him. She came out to him and said, Turn aside, my Lord. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. What does this remind you of? Who do you normally give milk to and cover with a blanket? Um, babies. Babies. This big, strong man of war with his iron chariots that doesn't have to lift a finger, really. Everyone does everything for him. He's got his 900 chariots. He's had to be degraded and go out on foot and run away. And then on top of that, God basically turns him into a baby. You know, did he ask for milk? He asked for water, but she's like, oh, here, here you go, baby. Have your milk, have your bottle. And then on top of that, she covers him. We read on. As she gave him this, by the way, the story doesn't really tell us. So far from what we've read, you might think, what do you think? Well, they're allies. So what is this woman doing? She's helping. She's helping conceal him. She's going to hide him. She's going to protect him because they are allies after all. But as we go on, she had this confusion because even though they were allies, she was still a child of God. Jethro and his family, Hobab, they still worshipped the true God. They knew that what Jabin, what the city of Hazel was doing, they knew it was wrong. She knew it was wrong. What would you do? Your allies, you're supposed to be good, and especially in their culture, hospitality was a big thing. We talked about that in the past. It's a massive thing. Should she do something? Should she go and tell, hey, Barak, the man you're looking for is over here. Come like, and destroy him. That would be really bad if she went and then got his enemies to destroy him, especially because they're allies. We don't often think of this, but she had this big mental conflict going on. She was confused. What do I do? We read on. Eventually, this confused woman, yeah, became a woman of conviction. All right, when you read through Judges chapter 4, what did she do? She grabbed a tent peg while he was asleep. He's like, yes, okay, I'm safe. I've bullied and I've gotten away with it. And that makes me so mad when there's people who think that they can just bully people and get away from it. God sees, God knows. He's there sleeping thinking, yes, I'm safe. No one's going to look for me, especially here in this woman's tent. By the way, she wasn't, it wasn't weird that he was in her tent. Probably her husband had multiple wives and she probably had her own tent. So it's not, yeah, it's not as weird as it might seem. He's like, yes, I'm safe, sleeping soundly. And while he was asleep, Jael, she ceased in her confusion. She became convicted that she had to stand up for what was right. She had to destroy this bully. And she grabbed a tent peg, she put it through his temple, and she killed him. It's full on, yeah? Judges chapter 5. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite, of ten dwelling women, most blessed. Lots of different Bible scholars talk about, oh, that was so wrong, like it was very unhospitable, you know, it should never be done that God's people hurt anyone. But they don't say anything about David and Goliath. But many scholars go on and on about how what she did, especially as a woman, was so wrong. But the Bible tells us that she was most blessed. Why? Because she did what God called her to do. You know, yes, okay, he asked for water and she gave milk. But this woman actually did the right thing. She was an instrument of God to hear the cries of Israel. As they were crying out for help, God used her to help bring deliverance to them. The conviction went on, and as, you know, Barak, who had finally decided, yes, 
I'm convicted now, you know, I'm determined. I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy him. It was too late. He went and she saw Barak come. He's like, oh, I know who you're looking for. Come, come, I'll show you. And there he was, dead with a tent peg in his temples. Confusion turned into conviction. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. That was the beginning of the victory. That was the beginning of the people of Israel having peace. Like Robin put it, they chose to do good again because they saw that God actually was hearing their prayers. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villages ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. What is God calling you to step up into? Each of you, thank you so much, Julie, for talking about the gifts that we have. Each of us have different gifts. What are the areas that God wants you to step up into? The people were being oppressed, and as we look around us, people in our world are suffering. Some of us right here in this room are suffering. Some of you bear it very well, but we're all going through different things. How is God wanting to touch you and say, hey, step up? Step up and be there for your neighbor. You might feel like a weirdo, but God is calling you to become a warrior. You might feel doubtful, but God is calling you to be determined. You might feel confused, but God is wanting to bring conviction into your life. Now, I don't know if he wants you to be a warrior and fight for your family. I don't know if he's wanting you to fight for your faith, because it's hard sometimes. It's hard to believe in the Bible when everyone, so many people around us are just telling us that it's not true. But maybe God wants us to fight for our faith. Your mental health, not to give up. Maybe some of you are struggling with your friends in different areas. But God's telling you, no, no, fight for your friends. Fight for them through prayer or whatever he's calling you to do. Determined. When we're doubtful. Maybe it's with your studies. Maybe it's with work, with health, or fill in the blank. God didn't create you to always be in doubt. He wants you to be determined. He wants you to know that he has a plan for you in every aspect of your life. But we need to be determined. He can give us our determination. I can't fill in the blanks for you here. I don't know what God is calling you, what he's convicting you of to start, to stop, to continue. But I know that God wants you to have the conviction that he is with you. You can have that blessed assurance that God is always going to be with you. Whether you're in the time of doubt and trouble, when everything's going wrong, when you feel like you're being bullied, God is still there. When you feel like you don't know God, I don't even know what I'm going to do after this year. I don't know how I'm going to pay my kids' school fees. I don't know how I'm going to keep my marriage going. I don't know... God, what do you want me to do with this work situation that is just so far out of my control? I can't tell you the answer to that. God can speak to you and convict you about that. But I can tell you that God wants you to have the blessed assurance that he is with you in those bad times. He will bring you through to the victory. But we need to step up. We need to fight. We need to not be doubtful. We need to go wherever he leads. I pray that whatever God is convicting you of, that we can be like that, those women. I pray that we can be women of faith. Do you have the faith of a woman, of these women that we've talked about? Whatever God calls us to, let's do it. All right, let's choose to be on God's side, even when there's confusion about what to do or where to go. His word does not disappoint us. We need to stand on his word. If God says it, Let's encourage one another. Hey, let's do it. Let's believe it. Even if I don't understand, why? Let's study it. Let's ask God, God, why do you say this? What's the big deal about the Sabbath? Sunday, anything else would be the same. 
let's talk with each other. Let's talk to God. Let's ask him to give us conviction. Because you know what? At the end of the day, God always wins. And if you want to win, I pray that we can all join his side. That's my prayer for us. Thank you.